Hey Exiles, Gassy TV here with a guide for the Occultist Vortex Cold Snap Dot build. This build is far from the best when it comes to general map clearing speed, but performs admirably in both endgame bosses such as Shaper and Uber Elder, as well as deeper Dell bosses such as Owl. The design of the build is to reach a certain threshold of damage and then focus the rest of it on surviving so that you can for the most part ignore boss mechanics and keep your damage up throughout the entire fight without worrying. Before we dive into the guide, I would love it if you'd hit that subscribe button and the little bell next to it to get notified when I post more content like this and much more. You're also invited to join our Discord community in which we talk about anything Path of Exile or other games related. I'd like to start the guide off with saying that it can be played in many different ways, such as utilizing the minion damage nodes on the tree, the spider specific unique item set, as well as being played in full rare items or even a life based version. However, I will be focusing on this specific CI version and the cheapest approach to the build to get you from being a zero to a hero. Since this build is a CI build, also known as Chaos Inoculation, which is a keystone node on the tree that makes you have 1 HP but complete immunity to all Chaos damage, including poison. The build wants to pick up a lot of life nodes early on, but the leveling approach can be done in two different ways. These ways are either to be life based till you have enough gear to get a comfortable amount of energy shield before switching, or by playing a pure hybrid, which is somewhat easier and also means that you're utilizing both energy shield as well as life nodes till you reach a point where you feel comfortable switching to key CI. Before I make this more confusing for you, let's talk about the abilities you use whilst you're leveling. You're gonna want to use a freezing pulse from the start and switch to Stormbrand at level 12. Pick up a brand recall as soon as possible, and this ability will literally cover you all the way up to level 70 without problems. I personally would use a storm brand till you're ready to switch to CI, at which point you switch to the Vortex skill as well. Before we talk about the end game approach and the skills you want to use, we're gonna go through the leveling tree real quick. Basically, when you start off playing with the Freezing Pulse over to Stormbrand, you're gonna pick up the spell damage nodes into Arcanist Dominion. After this, you can pick up the elemental damage node into Lightning Walker since you'll be focusing on Stormbrand till you do the switch, which will also mean that you're required to respec this node and put into Frostwalker when you finally move over to the Cold approach. At this point, you can also pick up Heart and Soul, including the extra life and mana node right next to it to get yourself some extra effective HP as you're leveling the build. The next stage, stage would be to move into the left side area, pick up Quick Recovery, as well as into Retribution, Discipline and Training and the extra life nodes. Now there's a few different approaches you can do here. I personally enjoy picking up Light of Divinity as well as Holy Dominion early on because they give you some extra resistances which is very useful as you're leveling the build, but also giving you some extra damage for your abilities. Now at this point you have two different decisions and this all depends on the type of gear you have and you'll have to decide yourself. In the, in the guide written on the forums I will have a preset uh, type of leveling trees available but it's very important to know that once at this stage of your tree you have two different options. As you can see the tree is traveling a lot of nodes everywhere on the tree and none of them are really picking up life nodes except for these two. This means that at this point you have to look at your gear and check how much HP you have. If you feel that you're not squishy or you're not in a situation where you're taking a lot of damage, that you feel that you're safe, then the best approach would be to simply go the north route and go in here and then pick up Cruel Preparation. So simply follow the routing that you're supposed to take and then get the Cruel Preparation node. And then continue moving over uh, to pick up Arcane Expanse for more damage and continue down the road to pick up some more damage as well as Lee's Life Nodes. However, if you feel squishy at this point, and you feel that, or at any point for that matter, it could be very important or very easy for you to do a little bit of a change to the tree and that's to take the southern route first, which is the last route you're generally going to want to take because it doesn't really give you much more than the extra energy shield and duration for Vortex, which is a quality of life approach, and then simply run down to Constitution. Not only does Constitution give you a lot of life, and it's just a couple of more life uh, routing nodes compared to the Cruel Preparation, it does allow you to take all of these extra life nodes However, you will be forced to respec these later, which is why it's somewhat smoother to play a hybrid approach using both energy shield as well as life as your defensive stats as you're leveling. 
So no matter which uh, route you decide to take, once you feel that you're getting up to level 40, 45, 50 plus around there, it could be very profitable in terms of effective HP to pick up nodes such as Unnatural Calm as well as Arcane Focus. That means you're routing over here and into this specific node. These will give you a significant boost to energy shield and help you survive if you feel that you really need it. I would personally try to stay away from this, but it is an option. After you're done with the, these decisions, you basically follow the road of, of the all the, um, the routing that you need to take. You try to avoid Breath of Rhyme, Heart of Ice, as well as Fingers of Frost to avoid these cold elemental specific damage providing nodes so that you have nodes that are actually benefiting the damage that you're actually doing. Now at a higher levels, you're going to have to respec out of the life nodes before you pick up Chaos Inoculation. And this is a very hard decision to make for someone that is not experienced with playing CI builds. So it's very important that you keep in mind that you re need to be able to switch to CI while still maintaining what's, what a comfortable number of energy shield is for you as a player. Now, I never personally change the CI until I'm around level 70 and can equip myself with at least decent energy shield gear. And since I'm very experienced with energy shield gear, I also know that I'm comfortable doing the white tier maps with as low as 5,000 energy shield, with a discipline active, obviously. Someone that's new to CI might want to have up to 6,000 energy shield before they do this transition. So if you're a little bit hesitant or you're feeling a little bit insecure of how much energy shield you'll have when you do the respec, you can simply go into POB and go into Import Export Build, type in your account name, click Start, and you'll be able to import all your characters from whichever league. So in this case, we can import my Vortex character and simply import and then import the items and skills. And we can now see that with my current character, this is how the tree looks. And I can then decide that, well, if I remove these energy shield nodes or these life nodes, sorry, and pick up these energy shield nodes instead of those life nodes, you can check on the left hand side that I have 9.8 thousand or 9,869 energy shield. Just make sure you double check that your actual discipline is activated. And that's an easy way to check exactly how much energy shield you'll get from a certain change. So let's pretend that this build doesn't have these nodes, just for the sake of it, and it's having these life nodes instead. Um, just do this as an example. And I decide, hey, I'm going to spec into CI at this point. So I'll remove the energy, the life nodes here, I'll remove those life nodes, and I see that, okay, CI will be picked up. I'll pick up some extra energy shield nodes. Let's say that the build is level 68 at this point, and I can now see in the bar here that I have 8,000 energy shield with my current gear. And I have pretty okay-ish gear, I'd say. The body armor is not great or anything, but it's okay the gear I'm using. And at this point, I can see that, well, I'm way above what I need, at which point I can then decide that, okay, I'll be fine with switching at this point. So that's a very easy trick to use to determine how much energy shield you're going to have when you, before you do the transition, so you're not in a position where you throw yourself into the oblivion with only two to 3,000 energy shield because you're going to die a lot and the build will feel really, 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 really bad. So let's go in to talk about the gearing of the character. Now, we talked about in the intro of the video that you needed to reach a certain threshold of damage. And you can reach and check these uh, specific uh, approaches by having path of building up and you can go into configuration. And what is very important to note is that the enemy is going to be chilled and you need to make sure that the enemy is hit by lightning damage and ignore skill hit damage. Otherwise, your damage will be very, very low when you're looking at the main skill vortex which is currently in a six link with the control instruction, swift affliction, elemental focus, efficacy, and hyperthermia, but we're gonna talk about the gem links in a moment. So let's focus on the actual gear. Now, I said that this was going to focus on a very low budget, so we're gonna remove the Watcher's Eye. Uh, we're also gonna remove Solstice Vigil, which then also means that we're going to be removing things like my temporal chains, wherever I hid that one. Uh, there it is, we disable that one as well. Now, what's very important in the configuration is that you need to turn in, is the enemy a boss into Shaper and Guardian? You also want to have the brand skill attached to an enemy, and that's really all things you need to have. Well, maybe full life and, energy, and you also have an energy shield, because otherwise you're dead. Um, and that's going to be checked. So the damage we're looking at with these configurations is the dot DPS of your Vortex. Now, usually, and I have done Uber Alert with 8,000 energy shield in a Tabula Rasa, Deathless, with about 250 to 300,000 Shaper DPS. I would suggest that you strive towards reaching 350,000 Shaper DPS 
to make very, very smooth Uber Elder Killer. This build is designed to do this type of content and you don't need millions of Shaper DPS, quite the opposite. You just need to have around 350 Shaper DPS because what that means is that when the ads spawn in the boss fight, you can kill them in one vortex, which means you run by it, drop a vortex on the ground, and then you can go and continue with the dodging of skills and abilities from the bosses, and that ad will die, making the fight very, very easy, and it's more about you dodging the abilities and just placing a vortex whenever you have the, uh, the opportunity to. Now, how do we get this type of damage? If you're looking at the gear I'm using, we have a jewel that gives me some damage. I can literally remove this jewel. I can remove that jewel. I can remove the jewel from my belt. Uh, my belt currently only has some energy shield, some strength, and some resistances. Um, sorry, that's that's not even my belt. That's a ring. I don't even wear a belt right now. <laughs> let's get that. Actually, let's remove the belt. <laughs> let's remove the belt. So the rings have energy shield resistances and what you want to do is keep an open affix so that you can craft faster start of energy shield recharge there is a higher numeric value that is a bit more expensive to craft i believe it's one exalted you don't need that one it's enough that you craft the one that costs two regals that's all you need you don't have to worry about it so the build's defense is based around this. The idea, together with the Essence Surge, allows you to start your energy shield recharge rate as soon as possible. And this, in combination with the Ascendancy node Vile Bastion, allows you to, sorry, with, with the Wicked Ward, means the energy shield recharge is not interrupted by damage if the recharge began recently, which means that you're actually going to recharge energy shield for the coming four seconds if you have not taken damage for roughly a second, together with the Essence Surge and the those rings. The Ascendancy Nodes is obviously the Wicked Ward and Vile Bastion, which is what most, if not all, energy shield based Occultus builds always takes. You're immune to stun, you get energy shield region when you're killing enemies, extra energy shield all over the, the field. And the other nodes would be Void Beacon to reduce enemy cold resistances, and then Frigid Wake, which also makes you immune to chilled and frozen and gives you some extra damage over time. So those are the Ascendancy Nodes that you want to pick up and the way they interact with how you're going to plan the gearing. The rest of the gearing is basically a pair of rare boots with as much energy shield on as possible. Now I only have 94 energy shield on my boots, but they do have a high intelligence roll, and as intelligence gives you extra energy shield, these are actually a pretty damn decent pair of boots. They have life, which doesn't really matter for this build. The uh, gloves, also same thing there, as high energy shield as you can find. You might need some dexterity or strength from your gear, so if you're able to find some with dexterity, that's just a bonus. Try to get some resistances wherever you can. The body armor, this is your one of your biggest pieces. And this is as much energy shield as possible being the focus uh, on the chest piece. I don't even have resistances on mine, but I do have a mediocre intelligence roll. The helmet follows this exact theme. It has a high energy shield roll. It's actually not really that high, but it's supposed to be high. And then have resistances on it. And those are the rare pieces that I suggest using. The belt, I'm currently using a crystal belt, which has a very high energy shield flat implicit number. You could use a Stygian Vice to provide yourself with an additional um, Abyssal Jewel that can give you even more energy shield and resistances and whatnot. So the options are very free to how you want to gear it or perhaps what you have available in your stash. Before I go into the weapon and the shield here, uh, I do want to mention that the Flask Sorrow of the Divine can might as well be a, a normal blue sulfur flask. The reason I took this one is because it actually has a higher duration. Now my tree doesn't even go into Selet's Oath, which is why I prefer Sorrow of the Divine so I can actually get use of the little bit of regen. However, as mentioned before, the defensive aspect of this build is not around regenerating, it's actually recharging. And that's why we have a flask of dowsing to remove ignition effects from us. And this one is used on a Stibnet flask in this example. Where you put this mod doesn't matter, but a Stibnet flask makes a smoke cloud, making the enemy miss attacks, and you also get 100% increased evasion rating. I'm also using a granite flask. Could might as well have been a basalt flask, doesn't matter. Make sure you have a remove bleeding flask, such as a staunching. I'm using a Jade Flask to make use of the increased evasion rating from the Stib Knight to make enemies um, miss attacks even more by providing us with flat evasion rating. In this case, I have a Warding. You could run with the Reflexes, which will augment your evasion even further if you use a normal blue Sulfur Flask of Warding instead. And last but not least, the Quicksilver Flask of Adrenaline. Since we are already immune to freezing and chill effects, we don't need a Heat Flask. So. The shield I'm using is currently an Aegis Aurora. It's honestly not very expensive, even with bad rolls. It doesn't give you much energy shield. There's a 205 energy shield on this, which is honestly rather low. 
However, you do get a lot of extra resistances, but most importantly, 5% plus to maximum cold resistance. This is the biggest part of this choice because it actually helps you versus the two hardest boss encounters in the game, which is Deep Delve Owl Fights and Uber Elder. They have the most of their damage being dealt by in form of cold damage. This one will help you negate much a ton of those damage sources, uh, which makes it arguably better than a rare shield with 400 energy shield. However, it does look pretty dope having 12 or 13,000 energy shield on a build, doesn't it? So to the most important part, and the reason we can get this type of damage out of the build without having these type of, uh, you know, no jewels, no belt, nothing, no amulet even. Amulets, uh, you can use a Solstice Vigil for high budget approach, but a rare one with energy shield, flat energy shield, and if you happen to come across some spell damage, it's absolutely fine. Uh, what's really good with using a rare amulet is that you can really squeeze in a lot of stats in it or attributes because you're going to need some help with that by picking up the 30 plus strength and agility nodes or dexterity nodes. So the build is utilizing elemental equilibrium. Now, here's another tricky part. Like this build is mechanically not very fitting for new players in my opinion because it's a ci build but there are ways to work around that so if you want to start with it go ahead and do it but i will be walking you through all of these parts like i did with the ci transition and we're going to do the same thing with elemental equilibrium the way elemental equilibrium works is that when you hit an enemy uh, and you have to deal some sort of damage it doesn't matter if it's one damage or one trillion or uh, quintillion damage it doesn't really matter of any element. So if one attack or hit or spell deals cold fire and lightning damage, the enemies will be getting 25% resistances to all three elements, but minus 50% to no element. If you then make sure that you hit the enemy with, let's say, lightning damage, the enemies will get 25% plus resistances to lightning, but minus to cold and fire. And this is very important to note that this is for every hit that you cause on enemies. This also means that you do not ever want to have any sort of mod on your tree nor your gear that gives you flat cold damage to spells. Now you can have increased uh, cold damage because that only increases any cold damage you're doing. But if you're doing flat cold damage, this ruins elemental equilibrium and will completely screw over your damage. So the way we're utilizing this is with the weapon. And this is the most important part of the build and requires an unveiled craft. The build works very fine before you get the weapon, but you're not gonna want to do the end game bosses without this elemental equilibrium spec into, and that is using a weapon that looks something in the lines of this. This is just one out of very, very, very many options. This one has a really bad implicit number saying damage penetrates elemental resistances, which only works on hits, doesn't work on your dot damage, so the base item is actually bad for us. However, this one gives us increased cold damage and 94% cold damage. That's actually two modifiers granting me that. And also a very important node called the percent to cold damage over time multiplier. So instead of the cold damage, you could use something like elemental damage or spell damage. It doesn't matter if it's a maze dagger or wand. So you have a lot of options. But what you want to do is find a weapon with either high spell, cold, elemental uh, or elemental damage. But you also want to make sure that you find something that has cold damage over time multiplier on it. The other modifier, as you can see there, is flat fire damage to spells. This means that my elemental equilibrium will always give enemies plus to fire resistances. I don't care about that because we're focusing on cold here. As long as it's not cold, it's fine. So the most important part about this weapon is the trigger a socketed spell when you use a skill. Now this is the tricky part about this. What's very important to understand with the trigger a socketed spell when you use a skill, which is a suffix, for those of you wondering, is the fact that it will trigger abilities in order of links. This means that the top one here will be casted first, and then the second one, and then the third one, and then go back. What's also important to note is that this trigger will also cause the abilities trigger to have a four second cooldown. And now why this is important is because together with the approach of Elemental Equilibrium, we're actually able to utilize this in a very nice way. Whenever I use any abilities, I will first proc my Storm Brands. If I use, let's say, my Face Run, you can now see that there's a Storm Brand on the ground. And you can also see that the next ability will be put on cooldown. Let me bring up the Frost Bomb because the second one is a Frost Bomb, which actually puts cold damage of Elemental Equilibrium on the enemies, which is bad for us but it also makes the enemy take a minus 25% to cold persistence debuff. However, the first ability is Stormbrand, which is an ability that attaches to an enemy 
and consistently does lightning damage. So as soon as Frost Bomb is out and deals cold damage, it will be overwritten by Stormbrand into having minus cold resistance again, which is why we're using Stormbrand. So my next ability will now cause a Frost Bomb to be on the ground, which will then pop, and then the Stormbrand will be doing lightning damage again on the enemy. The third ability I'm using is Orb of Storms. Similar strategy as Stormbrand, the Orb of Storms is actually there to be an ability that consistently hits enemies uh, within the radius. So the reason we're using Stormbrand and Orb of Storms is to make sure that whenever we're casting all of these cold damage abilities, we're going to have a lot of lightning damage sources overriding our cold damage so that our damage over time, which is what we're focusing on, is having a beneficial use of the Elemental Equilibrium. And that's why this trigger socket spell to use when you use a skill is very important and pretty much the most important item of the entire build before you go into the uber uh, end game boss killing because this one will scale your damage in so significantly high it's just insane if you can look at the current dps i haven't figured uh, sorted all the configuration by just removing elemental equilibrium you can go and see my shaper dps going from 577 down to 391 and i have pretty decent gear in a finalized skill tree at level 93 at the moment and uh by just adding that you, it's close to double the damage not really but it's, it's not far away uh making this an extremely beneficial approach to the build but it does require that specific craft Last but not least, we will be covering the different gems being used. We've already talked about the Scepter using Stormbrand, Frostbomb and Overstorms in that specific order. We're going to talk about the other abilities. Now, they're very straightforward. We can start talking about the Vortex, which is a Vortex linked with Control Destructions, Elemental Focus, Swift Affliction, Efficacy and Hypothermia. Now, why we have these set up is basically because that's what deals the most damage. I wanted to get some socket space on my gear, so I'm actually using my Discipline Aura in an Unset Ring. This is not really needed because you can change things like the efficacy in my Phase Run setup, which is basically the mobility we have through the ability uh, for the build, and that is using Phase Run together with increased duration, and efficacy does increase it slightly, but you don't really need it, so you could use a Resistance Ring to ease up on the budget for the gear, even though it's already very cheap. And this is also linked with the Arc Insert, which I'm keeping at level 5, and I don't want to focus too much on Dexterity, I'm actually only using a level 8 face run because I have 112 dexterity with my current approach of the build. This means that every time I cast a face run, which costs 23 mana, this box for every 22, I get a pretty long duration increase of more spell damage as well as cast speed and mana regeneration. And this has a longer duration thanks to the links and my skill tree than the cooldown of face run. So I actually will always have a face run, uh, sorry, Arc in Surge available. The other links we're using is the um, Cold Snap which is a Vol Cold Snap, very important to note that it is a Vol Cold Snap, linked with Bone Chill, Efficacy, and Hypothermia. This is basically to make more use of the Bone Chill to increase the damage dealt by our Vortex for bosses, and the reason we have a Vol Cold Snap is so that we can, to some degree, sort the rather slow clearing of the build by popping the Vol Cold Snap when you have enough souls, and then you, most cases, just run through enemies and they will just die as you go through them. The other links we're using is a standard castle damage taken setup together with Immortal Call. This is increased by the, the duration nodes from the trees. I'm actually not using an increased duration gem. Instead, I have a level 20 Malevolence, which is not triggered by the castle damage taken that I'm keeping at level 3, and the Immortal Call at level 5. Malevolence uh, was actually a lot more damage than using a curse such as uh, Frostbite, and it was better than any other approach such as Hatred for this build. It's just an insane uh, amount of damage you gain from using Malevolence uh, since the 3.6 patch. The uh, last note is basically, or the last four links, is Flame Dash with faster casting, which I'm also having linked with Blasphemy and Temporal Chains. Now, you don't need Temporal Chains at all unless you have a Solstice Vigil, otherwise you will not be able to run it on your mana pool. This is not something you need to do endgame bosses with. It helps very, very little against bosses, in, to be honest, but it's very nice to use for very, very, very hard rolled maps uh, or deeper delving. And this is enabled through having a Solstice Vigil amulet, which allows us to do that. I hope you guys found this build guide useful. I have a more detailed description in a written version in the forum thread listed and linked in the description below the video. I'd love to hear you guys thoughts about this build because this build can be played in so many different ways. Have you tried it? 
Uh, is it something you want to do? Let us all know in the comments below if you wanted to try or have tried a different version or another approach to the build than that I've displayed here in this video. And as always, Exiles, till next time, stay safe and keep rocking.